Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of faculty, students and staff, and members of the public. Professor John Lennox of the University of Oxford is speaking on the topic, A Matter of Gravity, God, the Universe, and Stephen Hawking. His previous talks have drawn massive appreciative audiences, uh, and this can, I think, be attributed to a combination of characteristics that he brings in his person. Uh, the first is the almost uh, star-like, rock star-like popularity that he has achieved through a number of high-profile debates that have been televised, uh, that are on the internet, and that I would strongly uh, commend you to go and view if you haven't before. Uh, <coughs> at Columbia University in 1912, he spoke, at, in 2012, he spoke <laughs> Just checking that you're paying attention. Uh, he spoke on uh, a topic. The topic was the loud absence. Where is God in suffering? Uh, at the uh, Veritas Forum at Davidson College, he spoke on does rationality lead us away from God? Uh, at the uh, also in 2012, he spoke on the topic science, creation, and Christianity. At the University of North Carolina on the topic, God, Fact or Fiction, uh, a published lecture, and also online, uh, in the topic, on the topic, not the God of gaps, but the whole show. He explains why scientists are wrong to call the Higgs boson more relevant than God. And he has, of course, been involved also in uh, several high-profile debates um, with, Richard, with Richard Dawkins, he has recently he has published a book, uh, recently called Seven Days That Divide the World, where he explores the method for reading and interpreting the first chapters of Genesis without discounting either science or scripture. He has produced a number of other books on the intersection between science, philosophy, and theology, including perhaps most famously God's Undertaker, Has Science Buried God, and another book, God and Stephen Hawking. And there are many reviews of these books uh, in, um, in, in newspapers that are so widely read that this is no doubt all contributed uh, to, his, to how well known he is and to his appeal to audiences such as this. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not only, of course, his interest in the intersection of science, Christianity, theology uh, that makes him so interesting, but the fact that his main background in most of his publications are actually in mathematics. Uh, he's a mathematician. He uh, for work, worked for many years at the Mathematics Institute at the University of Wales in Cardiff, which also awarded him a senior <coughs> doctorate, the Doctor of, si doctorate of Science, for his research. Uh, he um, also has an MA and PhD from Emmanuel College, University of Cambridge. And that PhD, he explained to me, is, is sort of transferable, that when you have a PhD from Cambridge, then Oxford gives you a PhD by incorporation. So he also has a default from Oxford and a master's and an MA in bioethics from the University of Surrey. He has lectured in many places all over the world, including many universities, but of course in the fields of mathematics as well as um, the other topics I had already mentioned. Uh, in addition to more than 70 published mathematical papers, he is a co-author of two research level texts in algebra in the Oxford Mathematical Monograph series. So I think his appeal, particularly in an audience like this, a university-based audience, is that you have someone who is clearly a, a committed scientist, a, a convinced scientist, who also, uh, who, does, who has no difficulty, in fact, is able to reconcile uh, what for many scientists is a difficult issue to reconcile uh, theories of evolution uh, with uh, ideas of intelligent design. In addition to all of that, he also teaches uh, for the Oxford Strategic Leadership Program uh, at the Executive Education Center of the SAID Business School at Oxford University, and um, so brings to all of his other uh, uh, assets and qualities, uh, the qualities of leadership and teaching and leadership. It's a great privilege for us to have you here, uh, Professor Lennox. Thank you for accepting this invitation, and uh, we, look very, we look forward to your address. Mr. Vice-Chancellor, thank you very much for your invitation to deliver a lecture of this distinguished series. 
It is indeed an honor for me to spend my first ever day in South Africa visiting this magnificent university. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming out this evening. I can see clearly that I'm not like the bishop who turned up in a country church and he was chatting to the vicar as he made his way to the front and he noticed to his dismay there are only three elderly people in the audience. And he said to the local vicar, he said, did you tell them I was coming? And the vicar said, actually, no, but word seems to have got around. <laughs> now, I've been invited to give a lecture, and our title is A Matter of Gravity, God, the Universe, and Stephen Hawking. Hawking is arguably the world's most famous living scientist. He was just ahead of me at Cambridge, and he's light years ahead of me in his intellectual capacity. He has recently retired from the Lucasian Professorship in Cambridge, a chair once held by Sir Isaac Newton, a chair that Hawking has occupied with great distinction. He has also been an outstanding symbol of fortitude, having suffered the ravages of motor neuron disease for over 40 years. During many of these, confined to a wheelchair and his only means of communication, that famous electronic voice synthesizer known all over the world. Now, since his books and his research deal with the origin of the universe, it was inevitable, of course, that he should consider the matter of the existence of a divine creator. However, his book, A Brief History of Time, left this matter tantalizingly open. And it ended with a much quoted statement that if physicists were to find a theory of everything, that is a theory that unified the four, four fundamental forces of nature, we would know the mind of God. Now, in his uh, latest book, The Grand Design, co-authored with Leonard Mladenov, Hawking's reticence has completely disappeared, and he challenges belief in the divine creation of the universe. According to him, now it is the laws of physics, and not the will of God, that provide the real explanation as to how the universe came into being. The Big Bang, he argues, was the inevitable consequence of those laws. I quote, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Now, of course, his title, The Grand Design, will suggest for many people the existence of a grand designer, but that's exactly what the book is designed to deny. Hawking's grand conclusion is this. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing why the universe exists, why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper uh, that and set the universe going. And of course, this all made headline news. And Hawking's stepping into this debate had the instant effect of increasing interest in it. And Stephen Hawking has, in a real sense, joined Richard Dawkins in the vanguard of the new atheism. Now, it is a grandiose claim to have banished God. After all, the majority of great scientists in the past have believed in him, and many still do. Were Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and Maxwell, to name but a few, really all wrong on the God question? And incidentally, that shows us the very fact that there are leading scientists who believe in God and there are leading scientists who do not show us that the simplistic notion that science is somehow at war with belief in God is false. There is a conflict, ladies and gentlemen, but it lies much deeper in. It is a conflict of worldviews, worldviews that come up to us from the ancient world. On the one hand, essentially the naturalistic worldview that says that the cosmos is all that exists, and therefore everything must be explicable reductionistically in terms of mass and energy. The other worldview is the theistic worldview that says the cosmos is not all that exists. It is created. There is a God who created it and maintains it. 
And you will find even today in the academy those worldviews colliding. And that's why there's such a vigorous discussion and great interest in it. Because people of equal brilliance, one could say, stand on each side of the debate. Now, I wish to engage not so much with Hawking's science, but with what he claims to deduce from it. The grand design opens with a list of big questions. How can we understand the world in which we find ourselves? How does the universe behave? What is the nature of reality? Where did all this come from? Did the universe need a creator? And big questions like that, of course, excite the imagination with anticipation of hearing a world-class scientist say what he thinks of them. Now, if that is what we expect, we are in for a shock. For in his very next words, Hawking dismisses philosophy. Referring to his list of questions, he writes, traditionally, these are questions for philosophy, but philosophy is dead. It has not kept up with modern developments in science, particularly in physics. As a result, scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. I found this startling. For Hawking's statement about philosophy is itself a philosophical statement. It is not a statement of science, it is a metaphysical statement about science. Therefore, because he claims philosophy is dead, he contradicts himself. Furthermore, the view that scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery smacks of scientism, the very widespread view that science is the only way to truth. Now that is manifestly false. If it were true, you'd have to close half the faculties in this distinguished university, for a start. Nobel laureate Sir Peter Medawar pointed out the danger of scientism in his excellent book, Advice to a Young Scientist. There is no quicker way, he said, for a scientist to bring discredit upon himself and upon his profession than roundly to declare that science knows or soon will know the answers to all questions worth asking. And he goes on to point out the existence of a limit to science is, however, made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions having to do with first and last things. For instance, what are we all here for? How did everything begin? What is the point of living? And Medawar, brilliant scientist that he was, says we must turn to imaginative literature and religion for the answers to such questions. Francis Collins, the second director of the Human Genome Project after James Watson, and now director of the National Institute of Health in the USA, who is a Christian, is equally clear on the limitations of science. Science, he writes, is powerless to answer questions such as, why did the universe come into being? What is the meaning of human existence? What happens after we die? Now, Medawar and Collins are passionate scientists, so there is clearly no inconsistency in being a scientist at the highest level while simultaneously recognizing humbly that science is not in a position to answer every kind of question, including some of the deepest that humans can ask. Now, Hawking's flawed view of philosophy leads to a flawed view of God. He writes, ignorance of nature's ways led people in ancient times to invent gods to lord it over every aspect of human life. This began to change when ancient Greek thinkers like Thales uh, began to think in this kind of way. Their idea was that nature follows consistent principles that could be deciphered. And so, says Hawking, began the long process of replacing the notion of the reign of the gods with the concept of a universe that is governed by laws of nature and created according to a blueprint we could someday learn to read. Hawking clearly here thinks of God of the gods as a god of the gaps who, like those ancient Greek gods, will inevitably be displaced by scientific advance. But that is not a view of God that is to be found in any major monotheistic religion, where God is not a god of the gaps, but the author of the whole show. Nor, incidentally, is God the god of the deists, who lit the blue touch paper to start the universe and then retired to a vast, uninvolved distance. God both created the universe and constantly sustains it in existence. 
Without him, there would be nothing there for physicists like Hawking and Mladenov to study. In particular, God is the creator both of the bits of the universe we don't understand and the bits we do. And of course, it's the bits we do understand that give most evidence of his existence and activity. Just as my admiration of a work of art or engineering increases the more I understand the disciplines of art and engineering, so my worship of the creator increases the more I understand the universe he has created. Now, I want to come back to the main conclusion of the grand design. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself out of nothing. And I want to concentrate on the word nothing, because we do need to seriously think about nothing, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> what lies behind this is the well-established cosmological view that space-time had a beginning. There was nothing in the philosophical sense, non-being. There was no space, time, matter, etc. And then there was something. The cosmos is one of those things that came to be. And so Hawking is, as he says explicitly, trying to answer the famous question of Leibniz, why there is something rather than nothing. So the first question to ask is, what does Hawking mean when he says, because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself out of nothing? Because there is a law of gravity, that is, there is something. And one presumes also that Hawking believes that gravity exists for the simple reason that an abstract law on its own would be vacuous with nothing to describe. The main issue for now, of course, is that gravity or a law of gravity is not nothing, if he is using that word in its usual philosophically correct sense of non-being, but he isn't. He later writes, we are a product of quantum fluctuations in the very early universe, referring to a quantum vacuum which is manifestly not nothing. So there's a contradiction directly. Because there is something, the universe will create itself out of nothing. But secondly, the logic doesn't improve when you analyze the next bit of the statement. The universe can and will create itself. If I say X creates Y, what do I mean? I mean that I presuppose the existence of X to explain the existence of Y. So if I say X creates X, I presuppose the existence of X in order to account for the existence of X. This is obviously self-contradictory and so logically incoherent even if I put X equal to the universe. To presuppose the existence of the universe to account for the existence of the universe sounds like something out of Alice in Wonderland, not science. Now, it's very seldom that one finds in one statement two distinct levels of contradiction, but Hawking appears to have discovered one. He says that the universe comes from a nothing that turns out to be a something, and then he says the universe creates itself. But that is not all. His notion that a law of nature, gravity, explains the existence of the universe is also contradictory, since a law of nature depends on the prior existence of the nature it purports to describe. More of this anon. So it would appear to me that the central assertion of his book probably involves a triple self-contradiction. And philosophers might just be tempted to comment that is what comes of saying philosophy is dead. <laughs> Indeed, I find this absurdity of desperation and contemporary attempts to get a universe from nothing. In his recent book, a universe from nothing, physicist Lawrence Krauss of the Arizona State University makes this extraordinary statement. Surely, he writes, nothing is every bit as physical as something, especially if it is to be defined as the absence of something. This is sheer nonsense. The universe is something physical, so nothing, the absence of the universe is physical, absurd. And in a wonderful review of Krauss, the philosopher David Albert says, Krauss is dead wrong, and his religious and philosophical critics are absolutely right. If what we formerly took for nothing turns out on closer examination to have the makings of protons and neutrons and tables and chairs and planets and solar systems and galaxies and universes in it, then it wasn't nothing. And it couldn't have been nothing in the first place. And the history of science, if we understand it correctly, gives us no hint of how it might be possible to imagine otherwise. The point is that a quantum vacuum is not nothing. 
Albert again, relativistic quantum field theoretical vacuum states no less than giraffes or refrigerators or solar systems are particular arrangements of elementary physical stuff. The true relativistic quantum field theoretical equivalent to there not being any physical stuff at all isn't this or that particular arrangement of the fields. It is the simple absence of the fields. The fact that some arrangements of fields happen to correspond to the existence of particles and some don't is not a whit more mysterious than the fact that some of the possible arrangements of my fingers happen to correspond to the existence of a fist and some don't. And the fact that particles can pop in and out of existence over time as those fields rearrange themselves is not a whit more mysterious than the fact that fists can pop in and out of existence over time as my fingers rearrange themselves. And none of these poppings, if you look at them aright, amount to anything even remotely in the neighborhood of a creation from nothing. Even Krauss admits it at the end. Empty space is complicated. It's a boiling brew of virtual particles. And it is not nothing. Alan Guth, who's one of the fathers of modern cosmology, and I had a little debate on the topic at the Harvard MIT Faculty Club a year ago. And I asked Alan publicly, I said, Alan, there's a problem here. People are very confused about nothing. And I said, you don't mean the nothing you talk about in physics is not philosophical nothing. It's not the absence of being. And he said, no, it isn't. I just wonder, ladies and gentlemen, is there too much ado about nothing? <laughs> now, what all this goes to show is that nonsense remains nonsense even when talked by world-class physicists. <laughs> what serves to obscure the illogicality of such statements is the fact that they are made by famous scientists. And the general public, not surprisingly, assumes that they are statements of science and take them on authority. That is why it is very important in this whole discussion to realize that statements by a scientist, including me, are not necessarily statements of science. Immense prestige and authority does not compensate for faulty logic. Now, the worrying thing to me is that this illogical notion of a universe creating itself is not some peripheral point in these major books. It appears to be the key argument. And if the key argument is invalid, in one sense, there's little left to say. But we need to say a little bit more about these laws, because Hawking, starting with a faulty concept of God as a god of the gaps, now begins to make a further mistake that is very characteristic of the contemporary debate and causes a great deal of confusion. You see, if you think of God as a placeholder, that the more science, the less God, as science begins to fill in those gaps, you will inevitably have to make a decision, as Hawking and Dawkins ask us to do, between God and science. And the problem there is not so much their concept of science, but actually their concept of God. And in Hawking's case, he asks us to choose between God and the laws of physics. And he says that their creation uh, of a great many universes does not require the intervention of some supernatural being or God. Rather, these multiple universes arise naturally from physical law. Now, what is being confused here are two very different things. A supernatural being is an agent who does something. In the case of the God of the Bible, he is a personal agent. Dismissing such agency, Hawking ascribes creative power to physical law, but physical law is not an agent. This is a category mistake. He is confusing two entirely different kinds of entity, physical law and personal agency, so that the choice that he sets us before is between false alternatives. Because when it comes to the matter of explanation, ladies and gentlemen, there are different levels of explanation. God is an explanation of the universe, but not the same type of explanation, nor in competition with the kind of explanation given by physics and cosmology. Suppose to make things clearer, I replace the universe by a jet engine. And there's sitting in front of us a jet engine. And I say, let's explain this. And somebody said, well, I can explain it. 
in terms of the basic uh, laws of physics and engineering. Wonderful. Somebody else says, I can explain it by telling you that Sir Frank Whittle invented it. Now, to suggest that those two explanations compete with one another or contradict one another is nonsense. Sir Frank Whittle is an explanation for the existence of the jet engine. The laws of turbo compression and combustion are an explanation of how it works. And the two kinds of explanation, one in terms of law and mechanism and the other in terms of agency, do not conflict, but they complement one another. And it is exactly the same, I would suggest, with explanations of the universe. And Isaac Newton saw that. When he discovered his law of gravitation, he didn't make Hawking's mistake. He didn't say, now that I've got the law of gravitation, I don't need God. No, he did the exact opposite. He wrote Principia Mathematica, the most famous book in the whole history of science, explicitly expressing the hope that it would persuade the thinking man to believe in God. The laws of physics can explain how the jet engine works, but not how it came to exist in the first place. And it's self-evident that a jet engine couldn't be created by the laws of physics on their own. It needed the intelligence and creative engineering work of Whittle. But indeed, come to think of it, the laws of physics plus Whittle could not actually produce a jet engine on their own. There also needed to be some material subject to those laws that could be worked on by Whittle. Matter may be humble stuff, but it is, is, it is not. Um, <clears throat> matter may be humble stuff, but it is not produced by laws. And so this can help us clear up a further misunderstanding. Science, according to many scientists, concentrates essentially on material causation. How does the jet engine work? It also asks the why question regarding function. Why is this valve here or that microprocessor there? But it does not ask the why question of purpose. Why was the jet engine built? What is important here is that Sir Frank Whittle does not himself appear in the scientific account. To quote Laplace, when we're giving the scientific account of a jet engine, we have no need of the hypothesis of Frank Whittle. But if we were asking the question, how is it that the jet engine came to exist in the first place, we would have to mention Frank Whittle. Now we might also just notice that scientists did not put the universe there, nor did their theories, nor even the laws of mathematical physics. Yet Hawking seems to think they did. When asked where gravity came from, he answered M theory. However, to say that a theory or physical laws could bring the universe or anything at all for that matter into existence is to misunderstand what theory and law is. Mathematical laws are what? They are a description of what normally happens under certain given conditions. This is certainly obvious from the very first example that Hawking gives of physical law. The sun rises in the east. But it is surely obvious that this law doesn't create the sun nor the earth with east and west. The law is descriptive and predictive, but it is not creative. Similarly, Newton's law of gravitation does not even create gravity or the matter on which gravity acts. And what is more, when we're thinking of this notion that science is the only way to truth, Newton's law of gravitation doesn't tell you what gravity is. Nobody knows what it is. I wish they taught me at school that many of the things would be described brilliantly by laws and we can calculate what will happen and so on, they don't actually explain to us what energy is, gravity is, light is, and so on. And Newton realized that. But often it is forgotten because of the great power, cultural authority, that science has. Newton's laws of motion never caused a billiard ball to race across the green table in the entire history of the universe. People with cues do that. The laws can help us analyze the motion, but they cannot cause the motion. And that is a thing that it seems to me to be often missed by, for instance, Paul Davis. 
a physicist with whom I've had a fascinating radio debate. He said, I've never liked the idea of divine tinkering. For me, it's much more inspiring to believe that a set of mathematical laws can be so clever as to bring all these things into being. But mathematical laws bringing them into being, well, in the world in which most of us live, the simple law of arithmetic by itself, one plus one equals two, never brought anything into being. It certainly has never put any money into my bank account. <laughs> if I put 100,000 rand and later another 100,000 rand into my bank, the laws of arithmetic will rationally explain how it is I now have 200,000 rand in the bank. But if I never put any money into the bank itself and simply leave it to the laws of arithmetic to bring money into being in my bank account, I shall remain permanently bankrupt. I wonder do some bankers understand this question? <laughs> C.S. Lewis grasped this with characteristic clarity. Of the laws of nature, he writes, they produce no events. They state the pattern to which every event, if only it can be induced to happen, must conform. Just as the rules of arithmetic state the pattern to which all transactions with money must conform, if only you can get a hold of some money. Thus, in one sense, the laws of nature cover the whole field of space and time. In another, what they leave out is precisely the whole real universe, the incessant torrent of actual events which makes up true history. That must come from somewhere else. To think the laws can produce it is like thinking you can create money by simply doing sums, creative accountancy. For every law in the last resort says, if you have A, then you will get B, but first catch your A. The laws won't do it for you. The world of naturalism, in which clever mathematical laws all by themselves bring the universe into, and life into existence, is pure science fiction. Theories and laws do not bring mass energy into existence. So Hawking has signally failed, and so has Krauss, to answer the question with which they set out to answer, why is there something rather than nothing? Alan Sandage, the father of modern astronomy, who discovered quasars, who won the Crawford Prize, astronomy's equivalent of the Nobel Prize, is in no doubt of the answer. He says this, he says, I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle. God to me is a mystery, but is the explanation for the miracle of existence why there is something rather than nothing. Now, like every other physicist, Hawking is confronted with powerful evidence of design in the universe, and he admits it. Our universe and its laws appear to have a design that both is tailor-made to support us, and if we are to exist, leaves little room for alteration. That is not easily explained, and raises the natural question of why it is this way. The discovery relatively recently of the extreme fine-tuning of so many of the laws of nature could lead at least some of us back to the old idea that this grand design is the work of some grand designer. That is not the answer of modern science. Our universe seems to be one of many, each with different laws. Now, clearly, Hawking recognizes a grand design. He's got almost an entire chapter devoted to these spectacular uh, examples of fine-tuning of both the laws of nature and the constants associated with fundamental physics. The evidence he gives is impressive and certainly fits in with what he calls the old idea that this grand design is the work of some grand designer. Of course it does, it fits like a glove, because there actually is a grand designer. The idea of a grand designer is certainly old, but the important question to ask is not its age, but whether it's true or not. Simply to say it's old can give the erroneous impression that what is old is necessarily false and has been superseded. And secondly, it can give the further erroneous impression that no one holds it today. But some of the finest minds in science do hold it, including some of Hawking's collaborators. The conviction that there is a grand designer, God the creator, is held by millions, if not billions of people vastly more than those who hold the atheist alternative, though, of course, these things are not to be decided on statistics. Now, Hawking's answer is not the grand designer, but the multiverse. The idea is, roughly speaking, that there are several 
uh, several or perhaps an infinite number, whatever that means, of universes in which anything that can happen will happen. So the argument goes, it's not surprising there's at least one argument like ours. I notice in passing, of course, that Hawking again falls into the trap of arguing false alternatives, God or the multiverse. But as many philosophers have pointed out, God is perfectly capable of creating more than one universe. It's not God or the multiverse. And the existence of a multiverse and its own fine-tuning raises all kinds of problems that go way uh, beyond this lecture. But it is worth simply pointing out that Hawking's ultimate theory to explain why the laws of physics are as they are is called M-theory, which is the theory of supersymmetric gravity that he calls the unified theory that Einstein was expecting to find. If it is, it would be a triumph of mathematical physics, of course, but far from abolishing God, it will give us even more insight into his creatorial wisdom. Don Page, who's a theoretical physicist from the University of Alberta, former student of Hawking, who's co-authored eight major papers with him, wrote to me personally, but he allows me to quote it, I certainly would agree that even if M-theory were a fully formulated theory, which it isn't yet, and were correct, which of course we don't know, that would not imply that God did not create the universe. And Hawking's claim to be the voice of modern science gives a false impression, since there are weighty voices who disagree with him. For instance, Sir Roger Penrose, his major collaborator, with whom he shared the Distinguished Wolf Prize, writes of the multiverse in Hawking's thinking. It's overused. And this is a place where it's overused. It's an excuse for not having a good theory. And Penrose went on to say that M theory was very far from any testability. It's a collection of ideas, hopes, aspirations. Referring directly to the grand design, he then said the book is a bit misleading. It gives you this impression of a theory that's going to explain everything. It's nothing of the sort. It's not even a theory. Indeed, in Penrose's estimation, M theory was hardly science. Now, please notice that Penrose's criticisms are scientific and do not arise from any religious convictions. He is, in fact, a member of the British Humanist Association. When we add to all of this with John Polkinghorn, that there's no access to these other universes, I am tempted to add that belief in God seems to be a much more rational option if the alternative is to believe that every other universe that can possibly exist does exist, including one in which Richard Dawkins is the Archbishop of Canterbury and Billy Graham has just been voted Atheist of the Year. I cannot hold back from giving you a lovely review of the grand design by Tim Radford. In this very brief history of modern cosmological physics, the laws of quantum and relativistic physics represent things to be wondered at, but widely accepted just like biblical miracles. M theory invokes something different, a prime mover, a begetter, a creative force that is everywhere and nowhere. This force cannot be identified by instruments or examined by comprehensible mathematical prediction, and yet it contains all possibilities. It incorporates omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence, and it's a big mystery. Remind you of anybody? <laughs> it is, ladies and gentlemen, ironic that Stephen Hawking and attacking religion feel compelled to put so much emphasis on the Big Bang Theory a theory originally suggested, incidentally, by a Catholic priest, George Lebetre. Because even if the non-believers don't like it, it resonates powerfully with the Christian narrative of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is why, before the Big Bang gained currency, so many scientists, including the then editor of Nature, John Maddox, and I remember it very well in the 1960s, were keen to dismiss it since it seemed to support the Bible's story. Some still, like Fred Hoyle, clung to Aristotle's view of the eternal universe without beginning or end. But this theory and later variants of it are now uh, widely discredited. The Bible, which has been quietly asserting for millennia that there was a beginning, has proved to be correct. And for those who think that the Bible has nothing to say about the physical universe, it doesn't have much, but it has something, it is worth observing 
that if scientists perhaps had taken the record of the Hebrew scriptures more seriously earlier, they might just have looked for evidence of a beginning in terms of cosmology earlier. But because of the influence of Aristotle, that perhaps didn't happen. Now much of the rationale behind Stephen Hawking's arguments lies in the idea that there's a deep-seated conflict between science and faith in God. This is not a discord that I recognize. For me, as a Christian believer, the beauty of the scientific laws reinforces my faith in an intelligent divine creator. The more I understand science, the more my faith in God is confirmed because of my wonder at the breadth and sophistication and integrity of his creation. In fact, the flourishing of science, modern science, in the 16th and 17th centuries under men like Galileo, Kepler, and Newton occurred precisely because of their conviction that the laws of nature that were then being discovered and defined reflected the existence of a divine lawgiver. That, to my mind, is fascinating. One of the fundamental themes of Christianity is that the universe was built according to a rational, intelligent design. And far from belief in God hindering science, it was the motor that drove it. And that is one of the reasons, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not remotely embarrassed to claim to be a scientist and a Christian because Christianity, the Judeo-Christian tradition, arguably gave me my subject. Now, the fact that science is mainly a rational activity leads us to another flaw in Hawking's thinking. Like Francis Crick, he wants us to believe that we human beings are nothing but mere collections of fundamental particles of nature. Hawking reduces biology to physics and chemistry and concludes, it seems we are no more than biological machines and free will is just an illusion. Hawking does not seem to realize what philosophers like Alvin Plantinga and more recently Thomas Nagel of New York, one a Christian, another an atheist, are picking on. And it's this, that if Hawking is right here, in this reductionist view that we are nothing but collections of atoms, that would not only undermine belief in God, it would undermine belief in the very rationality we need to study science, and of course, inevitably, it would undermine belief in atoms themselves. Indeed, if this reductionist view were true, how would we know it? If the brain is thus merely the end product of a mindless, unguided process, then there's no reason to believe in its capacity to tell us the truth. Now, this argument seems to me to be a very important, and I would suggest it is certainly for me one of the major reasons why I discount atheism. It's not so much because I'm a Christian, but because the logical conclusion of the reductionist uh, worldview is to leave rationality without justification. Whereas, if you look in the other direction, the existence of our capacity to do science, that is for rational thought, is surely a pointer not downwards to chance and necessity merely, but upwards to an intelligent source of that capacity. We live in an information age, and we are very well aware that language type information is intimately connected with intelligence, however many and complex the natural processes involved are. For instance, we only have to see a few letters of the alphabet spelling our name in the sand at the coast here um, to recognize at once the work of an intelligent agent. And I find it interesting, ladies and gentlemen, that just a few letters of our name written in a beach immediately cause us to argue upwards to intelligence. We don't necessarily know all the processes that have been involved to get those letters in the sand, but because of their semiotic nature, because they encapsulate information, we deduce that intelligence must be involved at some stage. That's with just the few letters of our name. But when we observe the bewildering complexity of the human genome with its 3.5 billion letters in that four-letter chemical alphabet, all in the right order, 
with the same kind of semiotic dimension coding for the proteins, I find it rather curious that people, instead of inferring that intelligence must be involved, whatever other natural processes are, immediately discount what they would never discount under any other circumstances. Hawking's atheism and that of Richard Dawkins undermines the rationality then that we need to do science. As a scientist, I myself find that by far the most compelling explanation is that behind the universe there is a grand designer of infinite wisdom and intelligence. It is my science, ladies and gentlemen, and not simply my faith in God that tells me that it makes perfect sense to say about our universe in terms of its ultimate explanation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came to be through him. Thank you very much indeed. Hello. Hello. Um, <laughs> I'm interested that you only look at the God perspective from a Christian point of view. I mean, do you totally disregard other religions and their, their perspective and their approaches to how they explain the universe using their idea of what God is and their methods. And also that you place such trust in, in the Bible, which you're assuming is God's word, and that all explanation comes from like a book that was written by people. In all the trillions of man hours in the search for God that theologians have been doing, there's not one shred of irrefutable, and I use the word irrefutable on purpose, there's not one shred of irrefutable evidence that God exists. Isn't that curious? Thank you. I would just like to, to ask you the question of if something can't come from nothing and if um, the universe needs a designer, then surely the designer needs a designer, him or herself. Um, and if, if you say that God, in actual fact, uh, came from, from, from God, then is that not... Um, hypocritical as a statement in itself. Thank you. Right. If someone was to assume everything you said was correct, then how do you go from that to like believing in a personal God that sort of can read your mind and cares about what you do? You know, you haven't really spoken in that respect. Okay, thank you. I think that will do because we have to be out of here in 11 minutes. Is that right, sir? <laughs> okay, right. Now this is a Q&A, ladies and gentlemen, so you will rapidly plumb the depths of my ignorance. <laughs> and all I can do is give suggestions of how I would begin to approach these questions. Each one of them would deserve a lecture. They're seriously interesting questions. So I say that because you're going to find it inadequate anyway. But I hope you'll do the work uh, for yourselves. Now, and the second question was, trillions of man hours have been spent, I don't know how you work that out, but let's accept that. <laughs> and, and there's not one shred of irrefutable evidence that God exists. Now there are several things that we need to find out what they actually mean there. What do you mean by irrefutable evidence? You see, in the world I work in, the mathematical world, we have the concept of proof. You do not get that rigorous concept of proof in any other subject, not even in the natural sciences. And so when I talk in the area of the natural sciences and elsewhere, it's evidence. Now, irrefutable means that the evidence cannot be knocked down in any way, but we're dealing with the kind of thing where you've got to weigh the balance of the evidence. And I would tend to agree there is no proof x plus y equals z, take the square root and take it to the logarithm and so on. Therefore, God exists. You're never going to get anything like that. I would say there is no irrefutable evidence that my wife loves me. And yet I've been married to her for 44 years and I'd stake my life on her. Now, I say that importantly because, ladies and gentlemen, God is not a theory, he's a person. 
And the evidence we demand for commitment to a person is much more sophisticated and complex than the evidence for belief in a theory that God exists. I believe there is powerful evidence that God exists. I've tried to present a little of it. I was debating one of our leading professors of philosophy at Oxford a couple of weeks ago, an atheist. And I said to him, Peter, try and put on my hat. If you were taking up the cudgels for God, what would you say was the best bit of evidence? And he said, oh, he said immediately the fine-tuning argument. He said, you've really got something there. Now, it's not irrefutable. But the point is, is the cumulative evidence enough in order to bear some weight? And I would want to argue, yes, the evidence is enough to bear a great deal of weight. So that's all about that, that I can say if something can come from nothing, surely the designer needs a designer. Now this is a very interesting question that I used to get a great deal in Russia. Because of my interest, ladies and gentlemen, in worldview, I grew up in Northern Ireland, as some of you can guess, and I'm delighted actually that cousins that I've never met before are actually in this audience. <laughs> but that's another story. I grew up in Ireland, which hasn't always the best reputation for displaying the graces of God. <laughs> and when I turned up in Cambridge in my first week, a student said to me, do you believe in God? Oh, he said, sorry, you're Irish. I should never have asked you that. <laughs> he said, all you Irish believe in God and you fight about it. Well, I've heard it before, but I decided on that day as a student in my first week at Cambridge to get to know people who didn't share my worldview. I've been doing it all my life, and it's taken me to Eastern Europe, 25 years of traveling constantly to East Germany, where I speak the language, and then subsequently to Russia, because I want to know what the evidence is. I'm trying to answer the question that the first uh, questioner asked, and I used to get this question, you know, you believe in a creator, but surely that's naive. Now, this is the heart of Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. It is absurd to believe in a creator, because if you believe in a creator God, you then can ask who created the creator, and then you have an infinite regress, who the created the creator the creator. Now, this is a warped version of the cosmological argument, on which I haven't time to give a lecture, but just let me come to a couple of main points, because Dawkins faced me with your question and so did Hitchens, and so did Singer. And um, what I said was, all right, let's analyze the question. Who created X? What does that presuppose? It presupposes, of course, that X was created. This is what some philosophers call a complex question, in that in the question are buried an assumption that closes down the possibilities without you sometimes noticing it. You see, if Richard Dawkins, let me put it this way, had written a book called The Created God's Delusion, I don't think anybody would have bought it. Because we know that created gods are a delusion. They're what we normally call idols. So the point is this, that to say who created the creator bypasses the central question, is there an eternal uncreated creator? And that statement, which I quoted from the beginning of the fourth gospel, in the beginning, the word already was, is a very carefully balanced statement because the next one is, all things came to be through him, not simply were made through him. They came to exist through him. And the Greeks were fascinated by this question. What are these categories of things that came to exist? They could see that they themselves came to exist. Did the universe come to exist? Did the gods come to exist? And of course the key question that's completely bypassed is, is there, as Jews, Christians and Muslims all claim, an uncreated creator? The question doesn't address that at all. But there's a sting in it. Because when Richard Dawkins asked me that question, I said, Richard, you believe it's a valid question, so let me apply it to you. You believe the universe created you. Who created your creator? I'm still waiting for an answer. <laughs> now, I could go into that further because it's an important question, but I can't at the moment. Two questions remaining. Do I discount other religions and their ideas of God? And there is a second part of the question, and the question of trust in the Bible. Now, the question of other religions is a very important question. And I know no other way of approaching this 
than by the matter of evidence, investigating the evidence. Now that would require a lecture to be fair to those other religions. But why I concentrated uh, tonight on what I did was because A, the lecture was short, B, the new atheists like Hawking, their attack tends to be on the monotheistic conception of God uh, that is the biblical worldview. And so I concentrated on that. Of course it is correct that we should investigate, and I've tried to, the conceptions of God that come through the other religions. Now this will seem to you, this is simply a statement, um, that I tried to consider the thing on the basis of evidence. And that's one of the things where I can bring the Bible in. You seem to place a lot of trust in the Bible. Well, actually, I hardly mentioned the Bible this evening, ladies and gentlemen, except to quote that famous statement at its beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, whatever you think of the Bible, here's a statement in literature, in one of the most famous pieces of literature in history, that for centuries has been in absolute contradiction to the prevailing worldview and has turned out to be correct. That is not a triviality. Dawkins said to me when I pointed this out, and he said, no, no, he said, you know, either the world had a, a beginning or it hadn't, it's 50-50. But the issue wasn't decided by statistics or casting a dice. It took enormous pressure, especially through the discovery of the cosmic microwave background, the expansion of the universe and so on, in order to shift people's opinion from the idea of an eternal cosmos to space-time having a beginning. That's all I mentioned tonight. I do have a lot of confidence in the Bible, but I would bring that into play, and it wasn't my lecture for tonight, so I didn't, but I would, and I've written on it, and you can check those things out. But it brings me to the very last question. How do you go from that to a personal God, and the God of Christianity is essentially the question? From the kind of argument that I've advanced tonight, that Hawking's arguments are inadequate in my opinion, there is evidence for a grand designer. But you've realized quite correctly that I go further than that, and indeed I do. And you're right in pointing out that there is a gap. There is a massive gap. Many of my friends, and there are people who are physicists, and they say, well look, Yes, there is intelligence out there, but please don't talk to me about a personal God. And the reason for saying that to me very frequently is, look at all the suffering in the world. Now your Vice Chancellor has very kindly referred to a lecture I gave on 9-11 in the open air at Columbia University. You can see that in, on YouTube, the light silence, what I would say about that. But the way I make that step forward is like this, ladies and gentlemen, very briefly. The statement in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. That is a massive statement to make, of course, in the contemporary academy, because it goes against what is sadly regarded as the default view of naturalism. But there's an even bigger statement that follows it, and that is, the Word became human and dwelt among us. That is a colossal statement. And it's either arrant nonsense, or maybe there's something in it. And I must answer, this was a personal question addressed to me. And I'll answer the questioner, and if the rest of you want to listen in, you can. <laughs> but it seems to me that you can only answer this at a personal level. I answer it in the same way as the previous questions, but it's deeper in. It relies on evidence, but not simply evidence of a scientific kind, but evidence from the other disciplines that are so well represented in this university. History, for instance, literature, experience. And that is that the Christian faith claims to be geared into history. It's not an abstract theory about God. It claims that God revealed himself in Jesus Christ in space, time, and history. I take that seriously, it's either true or false. And so I make that personal step 
to belief on the basis of a whole lot of other evidence, including, well, there are two parts to it. There's the objective side in terms of the science and the history, but then there's the subjective side. Christ claimed, for instance, that he had the power to forgive sin and bring his peace with God. Does that work? And all I could say to you, ladies and gentlemen, I find that that's utterly real in my life. Now, you say, well, that's psychological inducement. Well, maybe, and we could argue that out. But it seems to me, in the end, that we must open ourselves up. Let me put it this way, as I close. If you want to get to know me as a person, you could put me under the most sophisticated magnetic detection equipment in this university. You could measure my brain waves. You'd never get to know me. So long as I remain silent, you'll never get to know me. But if I start to speak and reveal myself to you, you have a chance of getting to know me, and I a chance to get to know you. And it seems to me to be perfectly logical. If there is a God behind our universe, then he's not less than we are, impersonal. He's more than we are, supra-personal, if you like. And if we are, these are big ifs, if we are created in his image, as the Hebrew Bible tells us, giving us infinite dignity, then it wouldn't surprise me if he took steps to reveal himself to us so that we could have a relationship. Now, this takes us beyond science, but ladies and gentlemen, not beyond rationality. That is the crucial thing. And if we get nothing else from this lecture tonight, what I want to plead for is this widespread, very misleading notion that science is coextensive with truth and rationality when it is neither. Thank you very much indeed for your patience. <laughs>